We are live. Welcome to 2021's Black Widow Review and Thoughts film. I specify film as opposed to simply character or at yeah, spider species. And yes, while we fans, of course, care more about this one, there are other movies called Black Widow, hence why I state the year. I watched the movie last night and was simply too exhausted to record right away, so I got a good night's sleep and here I am. So if you did not watch my video where I explain about the delay, and I am going to give a little bit of new information here as well, the reason I only get to this movie now was, you know, I don't know, I guess I'm about two weeks late, is because a friend of mine and I watch almost all of these comic book movies together, and he wasn't able to watch it until last night. Now, so yeah, this movie has been delayed. I wrote in my notes, let's see, it was supposed to premiere the 29th of April last year, then the 29th of, let's see, is that November, October of last year, and then January of this year. So, yeah. Now, I realize this video is long, but if you're only interested in the view, that part of the video is not the whole length of the video. To see its length, check the time codes in the description box. I am currently dealing with some back pain, but I still have a lot to say about the movies that I watch, so I'm going to speak faster until my back feels better. And I start this video with a review where if I spoil anything, I will verbally warn before I do so and hold up an index finger until I'm done with the spoilers. You can mute and skip ahead until you see me lower my index finger. Also, please note, I will not warn before spoilers for earlier entries in this franchise, including the three Disney Plus shows. Also, also, as soon as I end the review itself, Please note, the rest of the video will have lots of spoilers for the movie and, again, for earlier entries in the MCU. And I will also be discussing the ending and post credit scene. so yeah. Everything is going to get spoiled and, like, hypothetical, you know, yeah, if you're out there, you still haven't watched the movie, I would definitely recommend not, not hearing any spoilers before you go into it. I was able to avoid spoilers almost entirely and I'm really really glad it had a much stronger effect on me than if I had known what was coming so if this is the first of these videos by me that you watch then just to get you up to speed I love every MCU movie although I don't make any excuses for Iron Man 2 and I love every episode that's come out so far of the Disney Plus MCU shows now a number of critics say that this is far from the best MCU movie it definitely does have some issues, and I will try to... I personally like this movie a lot, but I will try to be brutally honest about its its issues. Now, content warning and or trigger warning. I am going to be discussing the potentially triggering content of this movie. Torture, kidnapping, ableism, domestic abuse, gaslighting, murder... I guess... I think I might cover them. Yeah. And, yeah, so the MPAA rating for this film is a PG-13. The, the video will be for those above that age. This video is not going to contain any clips of any kind. The most visual it gets is when I sometimes act something out. So feel free to watch something visual, such as clips from a movie in another tab. I won't mind. Now, before you watch this movie, you should definitely watch the, the other MCU movies featuring Black Widow. You know, you should have watched each of those at least once. At the very least, the ones leading up to and including Civil War. You don't, you don't need to have watched anything that comes after, although I do think it makes the movie even more effective. And I know some people have said the exact opposite, that they felt that the fact that they already know... Yeah, I mean, I already said that I'm, I'm, I'm spoiling past the, the... Yeah, I'm spoiling the movies leading up to this. We already know going into this movie, you know, yeah, unless you didn't watch those, that Natasha is going to die in Endgame. And some people felt that that meant that this movie came out too late. It was just, what's the point? But I would say there are several things in it, you know, it does the prequel thing of trying to give you new information that makes it stronger, you know, the... the you already know what's going to happen after, at least some of what's going to happen after, and now it's it hits harder. And I think I don't 
I don't think everything it does in that regard is effective, but a lot of it is. Most of it is, I would say. Now, since we're still dealing with Corona, I must say, during this video, it is possible that I will touch my face. I want to assure you, I washed my hands since the last time I was outside, and I will wash my hands again before filming out. So yeah, I have only watched this once, and yeah, you know, usually for these, I record right after I've, I'm done watching a movie. I was simply too exhausted last night, and I do still, it's still extremely fresh in my mind. And, you know, usually I record videos on Saturday. I chose to do it today, Friday, simply because I really don't want the movie to, you know, I, I, I find that my videos come out better if I record very, very soon after I've watched. Now, this... This might be the first. It's certainly one of the first times where I record one of these videos, and I mean, I do have a bunch of notes that I took while watching the movie directly on the on the notepad. Very frequently, I will go directly into them when I start recording one of these videos, but I find that a lot of the ones. I, I want to discuss them once I get into the spoiler section, and most of what I would be saying review, yeah, yeah, everything that I will be saying review wise, you know, outside of spoilers is in my notes for the review section. You know, some of uh, most of which I wrote in based on what I read of other people's reviews, without spoilers, of course, and a little bit of. Of, of stuff that I wrote in after watching the movie. So, last night, right before I went to bed, and this morning. So, plot. Set shortly after the events of Civil War, before those of Infinity War, Natasha travels to Budapest and meets back up with her adoptive family. So, something that people have been wondering about this movie was, do we finally get to know what happened in Budapest? Yes, and it was well worth the wait. And, you know, I've, I've seen some people say, why didn't we get the, you know, it's it's described, we don't see it, why didn't we get a movie of, I mean, it's not impossible that we might, although, you know, it depends on whether, I, I would 100% understand Scarlett Johansson does not come back for more movies, but, you know, it's it's not exactly impossible, but, yeah. And the movie also wisely explains why its events didn't happen sooner, and why the villain of this movie did not try to kill Natasha before the events of this movie. You know, depending on which critic you ask, either Black Widow has bite or Black Widow bites. Let's see. Yeah, so, quoting a fellow critic here, yeah, this person gave it a 0 out of 10, and they said that the film is so bogged down, the story does not even really start for like an hour into it. Mm, yeah, to, to an extent, that is... Yeah. And he says, they say, by then I could give a toss. I personally was hugely invested from the very start to the very end of this movie. And they go on to say, this is why Guardians of Thor 3 stood out so much. Is like them or hate them, they were legitimate films with their own style. This is pretty much identical to Falcon and the Winter Soldier TV show. For sure, it has, you know, it, it takes a number of cues from that show. I wouldn't say that it has no identity or, per or personality. I would actually specifically say this is one of the ones that, you know, goes a little, uh, goes somewhat, a, a, a good amount goes outside of the MCU house style, and it, it is one that, you know, I love the MCU, I already mentioned that, but I do think that, you know, others have pointed out the strength of the MCU lies in the shared continuity and the fact that you can tell all of these are part of the same overall cinematic universe. 
they exist within the same world where, you know, I think that the, the DCU does incredible at standalone. You know, I don't think that, you know, yeah, like, I think Joker is an amazing movie, and that movie definitely does not exist in the same world as, like, Wonder Woman or the movies featuring Superman, you know, so that, you know, that allows the DCU to really experiment with style more so than the MCU, but I do think that this is a movie that does have an identity, and it's it's one I'm going to remember for a long time, where some of them kind of, they they don't stand out quite as much as would maybe be beneficial to them. Now, let's see, so, yeah, uh, for, for a number of these videos, I go into whether the title has special significance, and, you know, yeah, it's the titular character, but this really is also about, you know, I, it almost should have been called Black Widows, but, yeah, because it's really, it's not just about Natasha the Black Widow, as we've known up to this point. There are a lot of Black Widows in this movie. Now, let's see. Some people say that Scarlett Johansson is kind of coasting in this movie. I don't really agree. I, like, I went into the movie kind of figuring, okay, I, you know, I, I, I certainly understand if she did. This is, like, you know, it took ten years for her to get a solo movie. That's ridiculous. Like, she's, she's a founding member of the Avengers in the MCU. She's one of the most important members of the Avengers. Like, if you go back, you know, she's, it's her who, in, in the first Avengers, she's the one who thinks of, we have to close the portal. She's the one who closes the portal. You know, Age of Ultron, she, if, if not for her, you know, they would not have Hulk in the final battle. And, you know, the, yeah, Hulk stops a number of robots that would otherwise have gotten to the, the, I forget what they call it, but the, the thing that if they, you know, they, one of the robots does eventually reach that, but by then, the, all the, you know, they, they've gotten, is it supposed to be all of them, or are there supposed to be just a few, I'm, I'm not 100% certain, but certainly they've evacuated many, many Sokovians, and, you know, Infinity War, if not for her, you know, Vision would have been captured in, in that first scene that, you know, the, the first major action scene that he takes part in, and Endgame, she's the one who sacrifices herself on Vormir, you know, if not for her, they would not have the Soul Gem, so, yeah, it's, it's, it's ridiculous, it took so long, anyway. And something I also sometimes go into is whether at least one person making this movie has something to prove. I would definitely say director Kate Shortland is making a case for, you know, the movie existing, for her to get to make more big movies, you know, for, for the movie being worth the wait, these kinds of things. Now, as a feminist comic book... Oh, right, yeah, that brings up... No, I will not be criticizing this movie for being woke. That's that, you know, that's what you want. This is not the review for you. As a feminist comic book movie, how does this compare to Wonder Woman 1, which I gave 7 out of 10, Captain Marvel, 7 out of 10, Birds of Prey, 8 out of 10. I have not watched Wonder Woman 1984 yet. I would definitely say it's it's high up there. I suppose I'll briefly, I, I will also give this movie a 7 out of 10, but in a number of ways it's close to an 8. I, it's one of the deepest theme-wise, although as others have pointed out, sadly, because it has to adhere so much to the MCU formula, it doesn't get as, as deep with the themes as it could. Which is too bad, because they're important themes, they're interesting themes, and when the movie does explore these themes, that's some of the strongest that the movie gets. 
let's see, was there, and in, in some ways, Natasha is not the best, like, you know, pop feminist icon, because she is compromised, you know, where Wonder Woman and Captain Marvel, you know, Birds of Prey also has a bit of an issue in, in that regard. For, for several of the, the major characters that are, you know, strong female characters in the movie. Which I, I don't think it's a weakness of Birds of Prey. I don't think that one's supposed to be as much these are role models as much as this is you. Be honest. When you really feel crappy, this is what you look like. And that's fine. That doesn't make you a bad person. You know, where... Yeah, you know, Wonder Woman and Captain Marvel, the solo movies, they are kind of supposed to be, this is what you can aspire to be. This is, you know, women don't have to be second-class citizens. They don't have to be, you know, they don't have to wait for someone else to save the day. They can save the day. And Natasha does do a lot of heroic things, but, and again, I do think that it's a strength of the movie, it does also acknowledge that she's done some really bad things, and yeah, so in, in that regard, it is perhaps, the movie does try to, to kind of say, you know, this is the, the kind of, I don't know, I guess, no, yeah, yeah, I would definitely say at times in this movie, it is saying, you know, Natasha Romanoff is a hero. She is what the, the world, you know, the world needs more like her. And I, I don't think that was the best. And it's, it's the, the MCU didn't need it because Captain Marvel already does that really well. You know, she's, she is a very typical woman other than the, the superpowers. And that is... You know, I'm, I'm sure many, many women can recognize, you know, she's she's in a male-dominated field, Air Force pilot, and yeah, you know, over and over, we, we see these flashbacks where over and over, she, you know, she falls down and men are saying, you shouldn't be doing this in the first place. But then she gets back up, she keeps fighting, and she makes it, you know, so they didn't need for this movie to be this kind of, you know, role model kind of feminist movie. The, the, yeah, the movie is stronger when the feminist movie that it is, is, you know what, everybody does something, everybody makes mistakes. It's not about being perfect, it's about what you do once you've realized you've made a mistake. What do you do to make things better? And it's about the kind of I suppose, yeah, yeah, you know, both of the, both of this and Captain Marvel, the, the solo movie, do have the theme that, you know, a lot of men are going to try to talk women out of, you know, being the best they can be and following their dreams. Ultimately, this one does, yeah, I mean, yeah, that's not a spoiler. You already know about the Red Room from Age of Ultron. You know, these are women who have suffered extreme trauma where, you know, once again, for sure, Captain Marvel suffers setbacks and, you know, she, she's mistreated by a number of men, but it's not quite the, the same level of, of trauma. And, yeah, the, the you know, the, this one, like, the 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 red room tries to break the the you know the the young girls who come in so that they are completely under the control of whoever is controlling the red room and this movie is about you know can you recover from that can you recover from being unmade and I th I I think the movie would have been stronger if they had com if they had focused one hundred percent on that and not done the you know heroic kind of thing. I I think an anti-hero rather than 
hero vibe would have been would have made it even even better and that's you know sadly the mcu can sometimes be very constraining and yeah now let's see yeah so quoting a fellow critic here this person gave it a six out of ten let's see yeah they, they criticize yeah, I'm just going to quote a little of it. Unfortunately, I feel this movie was hit by the woke train. Men are dumb brutes, cowardly manipulators. And then they go on to say, women are victims and would never do anything bad. And see, I don't think the movie's saying that. I don't think the movie's saying that women never do anything bad. It's just that it doesn't... It doesn't insist on that as quite as much. It, it doesn't let the the... Yeah, these these are moral morally compromised women, and the movie works really well when it lets them be that when when they're called out for that when they admit that, and and the the heroism aspect just isn't quite like I th I think they could even have made it like a big thing like you know there's that. Uh, Okay, yeah, so so a quick brief spoiler for the, I forget if there's more than one, but the first Q episode, the first time Q appears in Star Trek Deep Space Nine, the, the you know, Q approaches, like, like he provokes Cisco, and Cisco punches him, and he says, you hit me. Picard never hit me. And Cisco simply retorts, I'm not Picard. And I think that would have worked well here. If one of the villain or, or bad guy characters had like said, I can't, you can't do that. That, you know, no hero would do that. And Natasha simply responds, I've never been a hero or something like that. Or you know, it, especially considering that this takes place after Civil War, when, you know, that was kind of, like, for a while, she was an Avenger. For for years, she was an Avenger, considered herself the hero. She, in, in Age of Ultron, she says, you know, I did this, I, I just had a dream that I was an Avenger, that I wasn't still the, the monster that they made, you know. No more spoilers for Star Trek Deep Space Nine. And let's see. Yeah, and and the the reviewer goes on to say, I wish MCU would let some heavy moments land instead of undercutting them with jokes. I don't think all of them are undercut with jokes, but they do undercut some and even the ones they Yeah, it's it's too too many that are undercut. It'd give the world more weight. I agree. I have not watched Red Sparrow. I hear it's a lot better than this, and that's entirely possible. I think an R rating would have made this a better movie, even though it does push the PG-13 rating. Excuse me, somewhat. I don't think anybody's surprised that this movie is substantially better than the music video for that Iggy Azalea song, also called Black Widow, which, you know, the worst credit beat me to it, but, you know, it should maybe be called Black Widow Baby, since that is how they sing it. And due to the enunciation, when they sing it in the chorus, it sounds like it should be said to an American infant in baby talk. Who's a black widow baby? You are. Yes, you are. Now, I watched this in a home theater, so I cannot comment on the 3D. Let's see. Yeah, so quoting fellow critics here. The lightweight story relies on implausible plot turns and cheap soap opera, soap opera antics. Sadly true. They gave it a 2.5 out of 4. And a number of critics said that the, the first and second acts are good, but the third act is bad. And for sure, it could have been a, a much... Yeah. The, the third act is very typical MCU and does not really fit the movie that came before it. And 
Black Widow aims to put a superhero stamp on the female Spider Girl range, can and cannot help but look like a pretender. They give it a three out of five, and I have to admit there are a number of female spy thrillers that I have not watched. I suppose it's easier to say what I have watched. I've watched all of Alias multiple times. I suppose that is pretty much. Oh, oh, uh, the American. What's it called again? The Nikita movie. I forget what it's called, but it it for some reason is not just called. Nikita, but yeah, the you know, ah, uh, what's her, what's her name again? The ah, uh, it's right on the tip of my tongue. But the it features the 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 young woman who's also in. You know, she plays a reporter in The Godfather Part Three, and a beach. Bunny in Jackie Brown, so yeah. But but yeah, for sure, it it could be strong. This you know, others have already pointed out this is not as good as you know. If if you want a spy thriller, you know, I would recommend. I was about to say any. Not just any. Born movie, but the Born trilogy I would recommend over this. This is definitely better than Legacy and Jason Born, but the the yeah and and like most of the Mission Impossible movies are also better. Like like if you want a really big spy thriller, Mission Impossible Fallout that really nails it. Where this one. Yeah, I, I don't think that it's, again, I think this has other strengths. And another review, I think this might have been Jeremy Johns. Captain America the Winter Soldier is a better Black Widow movie than the actual Black Widow movie. Yeah, to, to an extent I agree. Before now, the story of Black Widow may not have been essential to the larger story, but after Black Widow, I cannot imagine the Infinity Saga without it. And they gave it an 8.5 out of 10. And yeah, I agree. I, I think it did. I, th I think it does an incredible job of filling in details that make it more, more powerful. And let's see. And yeah, one more. Critic Black Widow wants to give MCU fans the reward of understanding a reference without asking them to do the work. This is diluted fandom, and they gave it a 2 out of 5. There's possibly some truth to that. I wouldn't go quite as far as. Anyway, so this was written by Jack Schaefer, the creator and screenwriter for WandaVision. And let's see, Ned Benson who wrote The Disappearance of Eleanor Rigby, Him, Her, and Them, and, and also directed those three. Eric Pearson, writer of Agent Carter episodes for Ragnarok, and script doctor on Ant-Man, Homecoming, Infinity War, and Endgame. I, th I think they do a, a pretty decent job of, like, like the overall, the, the plot could be stronger, but... Again, like thematically, it's very strong. And that is, you know, partially writing and partially directing. It does fine on plot twists. There are not too many. I don't think they're bad, but for sure some people do. And there are not too few. And they're, they're also not too easy to figure out for the viewer. I didn't really have a problem keeping up with all the twists, but there were a few plot points where I had trouble keeping up with, like, like stuff that kind of seemed like we were just supposed to, uh, what's it called? We were supposed to, to 
surmise something that I think would have been better if they just came out and said it. Especially like there's a there's a major plot point early on. I suppose. Yeah, I, th I think I'm just gonna. Brief spoiler for early plot points. Early in this movie, it turns out that there is this gas that undoes this mental control over Black Widows. And we see that this gas ends up in the hands of Yelena. And not long after, we see that Natasha has it. And it is like, it is we are basically given enough information to piece together how it ended up with Natasha, but I do think it would have been stronger if it had been slightly more spelled out. No more spoilers for this movie for the time being. Now the direction, I wish I could claim it was always focused, but there are a few times where it is a little aimless and you can tell that you know, Kate Shortland is at times struggling against, like, the producer, you know, the, the things that she has to make sure are in the movie. You know, the MCU have a formula, you know, which basically, you know, regardless of who you are, there's supposed to be at least one element of the formula that appeals to you and because of that you're more likely to go see the movie than a movie that is maybe more distinct but doesn't have any elements that would appeal to you specifically and some of those definitely do force the the movie into I, I would definitely say that the movie could be stronger if it allowed more time to pass without an a big action scene you know, they'll they'll start to get into themes and backstory that's really compelling and then oh it's time for an action scene because that what that's what the formula says and you know the they are very Yeah, it's it's not very common in MCU movies today that the the that there aren't as many action scenes as the the kind of what yeah and but but yeah this is the first MCU movie to, entirely directed by a woman Captain Marvel had one woman and one man directing it I have not watched her other movies but they are 2017's Berlin Syndrome 2012's Lore and 2004's Summer Sultan this is the first action movie and the first big blockbuster as I'm, I'm almost certain that she has you know yeah that she has directed and she does a really good job. Like, there are a few issues where you can kind of tell that she's not super used to this, but she makes some really interesting decisions that work out well for the movie. And that I will get into very soon. And, yeah, so quoting fellow critics here, Thankfully, director Kate Shortland infuses rich dynamics in the relationships and a more character-based approach to the action. And, yeah, that's those are definitely some of the, the strengths. And this really gave it a 4 out of 5. It should come as no surprise that a film churned out by the biggest entertainment conglomerate on Earth is, in fact, a de facto apologia for American exceptionalism. And I really wish that I could say that that's not at all the case, but it's kind of true. And the, this review gave it a 2 out of 4. Now, the opening is excellent. Like, there's this scene where you see the, the childhood of, I suppose you could say you see, ah, that's yeah, you, you see a little bit of the childhoods of Yelena and Natasha with Melina and Alexei as their sort of, I suppose we could go with adoptive parents. As they, you know, they're basically a, a sleeper cell in America of, of 
communists. And yeah, we, we see how that ended. And it's it's powerful because it legitimately seemed like they they didn't necessarily all love it equally, but all of them had something there that they really liked and that they missed after it was gone. And it does a really good it sets the stage, you know, immediately and, and that's something like a while back, the MCU would not dare to get this unapologetically tragic. And it really is. And and again, sadly, it doesn't last the entire movie, but sometimes the movie really acknowledges how painful the past of these people are, and as a direct result, how painful their present is. And the opening also uses a cover version of Smells Like Teen Spirit, which some people have criticized. I loved it. I thought it was excellent. And yeah, the opening does a good job of setting up some of the main themes of the movie, including, I will just brief, yeah, I wrote it down here, pain makes you stronger. The, the sort of the veracity of that claim, of that statement. The ending. I'm not gonna, going to give away whether it's a happy ending or a sad ending. I will say that it does fit with the rest of the third act, not necessarily the first, yeah, the first two acts of the movie. Overall, I am fairly happy with how the movie ends. It does not use Deus Ex Machina. There is perhaps a little bit of convenient writing. But, but yeah, the ending, if, if I were to change one major thing, it would be the third act of this. Now, as an adaptation, it changes some things from the comics. I think most of them are for the better. It, it is one of the, you know, some people have criticized it from a purist standpoint. Some people have argued that the changes, you know, some of them were unnecessary, some of them made the movie worse. I think largely they made the movie better than if they just directly went with everything. Let's see. So it is also a prequel. And a problem with a number of prequels is that the prequel provides a piece of information or a characterization of the like that actually makes the other movies make less sense, be less satisfying. This happened with the Star Wars prequels, Men in Black 3 with the time travel element. That didn't really happen here. And uh, again, there were a few things where they actually, it made things better. Like by the end of this movie, you appreciate more what happened with Natasha after the events of this movie you know, in, in Infinity War and Endgame. Now, there is definitely some fan service, and I would say it understands the, the ideas of the source material. I, I don't think that the changes were because they didn't get it. And I, I realize not everybody agrees with me on that. I, I do think they were very conscious changes. Now, the the superpowers, the, the abilities and, and such, yeah, yeah, abilities, not as much superpowers. This is much more grounded, despite the fact that some of the characters will survive ridiculous things. But the, yeah, the, the abilities are, you know, they, they follow the source material, they are used well and a lot. And it is easy to fault, like, a problem with some adaptations where, like, superpowers are a major thing is you have to communicate to the audience what superpower is being used, what is the person using the superpower trying to accomplish, and whether it worked or didn't work, why did it, you know, not work or work. And, you know, I'd, I'd say, for example, the 
some of the original X-Men movie, the, the first X-Men movie, did a, a, a good job of this. Like, you'll, you'll see Cyclops, you'll see his concussive blasts from, from his eyes, you'll see them multiple times over the course of the movie, and you can tell why sometimes, like, it, you know, sometimes it'll be, like, a, a powerful blast, sometimes it'll be this really small blast, and you'll see he'll put his hand to his temple, and you see this little, like, what, what are those called? It's not a slider bar, but it's like a thing he can manipulate, and, and clearly that thing controls the power and precision of the blast. And, yeah, this movie does a good job with that. Now, the, the characters. This is one of those movies where, like, some of the characters have to, yeah, yeah, some of the characters, we have to buy that these, you know, we, we meet, like, there are, yeah, Natasha, Yelena, and Melina all went through the Red Room. We have to believe that, even though in real life they're actors, you know, they've never gone through anything as bad as the Red Room, and thank good, thank goodness for that. And yeah, they they are very convincing. They're they're completely convincing. Like I really believed, you know, I've I've seen some of these actors in other movies, and they'll like smile, they'll be happy, and in this, it's just there's always this sort of darkness to it, where like you you know that. These are people who didn't get to have a childhood. They didn't get to have, like, like early on in the movie, Yelena says, "For the first time in my life, I can make my own choices." And she's just talking about a piece of cloth, an article of clothing she bought, and and s think about how, like, that's something we, the rest of us, take for granted, buying our own clothes. But she, to her, it's like this big thing, and she's, you know, she's like. I don't know, maybe 30 or 25, 30, some, somewhere around that, you know, character and actress alike, I'm, I'm pretty sure. And this is the first time she's gotten to make her own choices, even with something as small as clothing, and it's a big deal to her, and that really, yeah, that that's, it's a, it's a very strong element of the movie. Now, it is one of those kind of movies where you are asked to feel empathy for some characters who've done some terrible things, and that has also rubbed some reviewers the wrong way, and I can completely understand that. It, the, the, yeah, I, it, yeah, briefly spoiling of a bit of a, big element in the movie. I don't think it's wrong for m movies, including, like, crowd-pleasing movies, to have major characters, even main characters, who have done or do do some really terrible things. The important thing is whether the movie itself acknowledges that what they're doing is terrible and whether there are consequences for it. And that's also... I when when you read other people's reviews, that's people. Many people criticize that that some of the main characters have done terrible things and they don't really face consequences, and that is kind of a, a problem for the movie. No more spoilers for the movie for the time being. Now the yeah, so this is directed from Wikipedia. Scarlett Johansson as Natasha Romanoff slash Black Widow. An Avenger, highly trained former KGB assassin, former agent of S.H.I.E.L.D., Johansson described the film as an opportunity to show the character as a woman who has come into her own and is making independent and active choices for herself while being in a dark place where she's got no one to call and nowhere to go. And I, th I think they do a, quite a good job with that. You know, some people have said that the movie, that, you know, Natasha bar barely needs to be in the movie. I agree that she's not, she's not, th this is not the exact same Natasha that we've seen before, but she is very important to the movie. She really is the one who drives, like, 
it's not not every single major plot development is her doing, but she is the one that like says, you know, we have to get the band back together again. We have to reassemble our adoptive family. We have to find them so that we can stop the the Red Room and General Dracoff who runs the Red Room now. And yeah, you know, she she really she's not blind to the imperfections. She's she's well aware that they've done terrible things, but she she's pushing through still. Now, Ever Anderson portrays a young Natasha Romanoff, and according to IMDb Trivia, she secured the role as young Natasha because she already speaks Russian and has a green belt in Taekwondo, because Mila Jovovich does not mess around when she raises a child. Like, she's like a, a teenager or thereabouts, and she already, like, Russian is not, like, like... I'm almost certain that her first language is English. You know, she, I'm, I'm, I'm almost certain that Mila Jovovich and Paul W. S. Anderson live in like England or America or something like that. You know, and you know she's an actress, so it, obviously it's important for her to speak English so that she can get roles in English-speaking movies. But Mila Jovovich is fluent in Russian, and she's you know, huge into martial arts. So, yeah, she she raised her child to, to do the same, and it paid off. She got a, you know, really significant role in a huge blockbuster movie. So that's, that's really cool. And, yeah, so let's see. I've seen some criticize the film, saying that we know Natasha can't die in this movie since she does in Endgame. I agree that that is frustrating, but that doesn't mean the movie has no stakes, which I've seen some say that it doesn't. Given that we don't know the supporting cast in this movie from any other MCU movie, they didn't appear in Infinity War, despite some of them being very capable fighters, or, or Endgame, except for Ross, there's a chance that they won't survive, and some of them. So, you know, they're basically like family to Natasha, and if she's in pain, we're in pain. You know, what if some of them don't make it through the entire movie? And, you know, or maybe, and this might be even worse, what if something she does causes them to lose faith in her, and they won't have anything more to do with her? So I definitely, I do definitely think the movie has stakes. And another thing is that since we know that she will die, any of them that survive her, you know, yeah, they will see her die and possibly be really upset by it, especially since two of them are sort of her adoptive parents, and, you know, they say that losing a child is the worst pain there is. Which, you know, that, that was, it, it wasn't the first place that that was said, it wasn't the first, like, series that that said that but in the miniseries Captain America and the Winter Soldier yeah the yeah that that miniseries reiterated that and had that as a, a theme not as big a theme as you know it, it definitely should have spent more time when Bucky you know told Think. Was it Mr. Takahashi that his name was? But but yeah, so you know, we've been primed for thinking of that as yeah. Especially since there are a number of similarities between that miniseries and this movie. Now, depending on which which critic you listen to, this is either the movie, you know, either Natasha deserved better than this, or this is what Natasha deserved. You know, and I I would say largely it's what she deserved. She she maybe deserved a little bit better also, but you know, MCU formula constraints. And some people have criticized the fact that there isn't a single male Avenger in this movie. There are several of the solo movies that don't have a major presence from another Avenger. 
it's fine if you don't want to count the first of the three heroes that got multiple the yeah the the first three solo movies for you know but that still leaves Thor 2 and Iron Man 3 you know the ones that had guests are Iron Man 2, Captain America 2 and 3 and Thor 3 obviously they did not want her to be overshadowed in her own solo movie by current fellow Avenger, I mean, no, I, I don't think that Yelena overshadows Natasha. I think they both really hold their own. Now, let's see. Yeah, so quoting Phil Critic here, though her selflessness goes against what life has continually taught her, that relationships are a weakness, that will always let you down. It's also the skeleton key to her legacy. What a thrill to finally be able to understand. And I think that's very true. And someone else said, as talented as Scarlett Johansson and Florence Pugh are, nothing they do or say feels honest or character driven. And I, I wouldn't say nothing, but there definitely are some things that don't feel, yeah. Once again, Wikipedia. Florence Pugh as Yelena Belova slash Black Widow, a sister figure to Romanoff, was trained in the Red Room as a Black Widow. Director Kate Shortland said that Romanoff would be handing Belova the baton in the film, and that it's going to propel another female storyline. Now, let's see. And Kevin Feige has also said that the film was written to showcase Belova just as much as Scarlett Johansson's Natasha Romanoff. And this is IMDb trivia. According to writer Eric Pearson, Florence Pugh teased Scarlett Johansson about Black Widow's iconic pose during filming, so Pearson put it in the film. That's I li I like that because that it's it's a pretty good element. I I've, I've seen some say that they they go back to the joke too many times. I I thought it was the exact right amount of times. Now. Yeah, so once again, quoting fellow critics, Pew steals the movie. Black Widow is trying to be a proper send-off to the first moment of the Avengers, but ultimately it falls flat due to how it was released and how it feels less like a send-off for Natasha, more like a setup for Yelena. But th this critic did give it a 7.5 out of 10. The film's true purpose seems to serve as a setup for the next Black Widow character, Pew's Yelena Belova, who will be taking over the franchise, but that could have been done in many ways other than this approach, and that reviewer gave it a 2 out of 4. And, yeah, it, it could have been better. And my friend that I watched the, this movie with pointed out that Yelena acts the way in this movie that Natasha acts in several of the, of the movies where she's the only Black Widow, and you know, we, we talked about that maybe that was something that bothered people. That was part of why people were saying that it just became her movie. And so I, I, yeah, I maintain it does do a really good job of giving Natasha, like, ah, what's the word? Like, she has some really strong character moments in this. And... Once again, Wikipedia, David Harper as Alexei Shostakov, or Red Guardian, the Russian super soldier co counterpart to Captain America and a father figure to Romanov and Belova. Harper said that Shostakov was a bit of a fatherly figure to Romanov and that he has tons of cracks all over him. He's not the heroic nobleman that people want him to be. He both comically and tragically has a lot of flaws. Discussions between Harbour and Shortland for the portrayal of Shostakov centered on Ricky Gervais' performance in The Office and Philip Seymour Hoffman in The Savages comedy that comes out of real domestic need. And quoting fellow critic here, also adding David Harbour as the Red Guardian, aka Russia's equivalent to Captain America, was just a bonus, and he does manage to steal most of the comedic spotlight. I thought they did a really strong he he, he was good as this sort of like, obviously, he's more exaggerated than, you know, 
the vast majority of, of real life fathers. He's more ridiculous than that. He's a lot stronger. You know, he has super soldier serum in him. But it does work really well as just the sort of he does want to be a good father. He's just not quite sure how. And and it's yeah, they they have some really great moments when it is this thing of like he is trying to relate to his his sort of daughters and yeah you know and and my my friend that I watched the movie with is a father of girls so, you know so he he said it really really hit him for for this yeah so the and and it is it is this clever kind of like the fact that he has super soldier serum, you know, many children will think of their father as just the strongest person in the world. So so having having him actually be intensely strong, you know, work, works really well. This is the first time he's in a comic book adaptation since he was in Hellboy and Suicide Squad. This is the first good comic book adaptation that he's in. He, he keeps trying and finally succeeded. And this was actually supposed to come out in 2019 just like Hellboy did. So, yeah, that's... And... O.T. Fagbenli as Rick Mason, an ally from Roma's shield past who is romantically interested in her. I, I quite liked, you know, he's 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 trying to help out in in this like he's in a very like his situation is very like him helping her now that she's on the run from you know Thaddeus Ross and yeah it it's He's, he's really taking a huge risk by still helping her. And that worked quite well. That, that, that this is sort of like... This is... She, she doesn't have very many people left that she can still trust. And... Let's see. Yeah, and William Hurt as that is Ross, the United States Secretary of State. A former U.S. Army general. He doesn't have that much to do. He's good when he's in it, but yeah. And Ray Winstone as Drakov, the head of the Red Room, and you know he's. It's it's no surprise to anyone that he can play a role like this, you know, really well. I consider joking that he could play this role in his sleep, and that must be why he decided to do so, but thinking more about it, no, he he does, like, he really sells it. He His performance could be even stronger than it is, and I would say, if if I were to point to anyone who's kind of phony, phoning it in, to, to an extent he does, but yeah, he's, anyway. And Rachel Weiss as Melina Vostokov, Slash Black Widow, a seasoned spy trained in the Red Room as a Black Widow, and a mother figure to Romanov and Glova, who is involved in a scientific experiment. And yeah, she she's really really good. I I think this this is more or less the first time I see her in like not action movie at all, but this kind of like yeah you know she she can fight and does. And she she does really well. Let's see. The character Taskmaster will be featured in the film, who has taken control of the Red Room. The character studies his opponent's fighting style in order to mimic them, learn how to use it against them. And some people really hate how they used Taskmaster. And I understand where they're coming from. And for sure there are things about it where, like, something that I've seen several say is that they should have just 
created a new character. They shouldn't have, if, if they were going to change so much about the character, they shouldn't have taken an established character that a lot of fans are very fond of. And, you know, maybe they only did so because they want those fans to go watch the movie before knowing that they won't like the, the character. And that is, don't do that. You know, yeah, create a new character. And I, th I, the movie could easily have sustained that kind of thing. They could have just created a new character and, you know, yeah, they could have taken, they could have had one of the, the like, this, this thing the Taskmaster does of studying other people's moves and copying them, they could have done that without calling the character Taskmaster, without the invoking the look from the, the comics. And... Right, that brings us... There's, there's really strong chemistry between a number of the actors. The, yeah, the, the two sisters and mother and father figures work... Yeah, you, you believe that they lived together for... I believe they say it was three years in America as a real family. Right, so according to the critic here, this movie has not only a boring plot, but the dialogue slash conversations between each other are just dull, and they literally take up more than half the movie. They, it definitely, the, the, there's a lot of dialogue in the movie, and a lot of scenes where people are talking and not really doing anything other than talking. I definitely don't think it was dull, though. I, I found it deeply compelling and I was really glad that the movie was allowing for that kind of thing when really like you know there are other movies in the MCU where there's a lot of talking but like for example the Iron Man movies it wouldn't just be talking they would also like they would be talking while Tony was working on a suit or like you know yeah and, and that's not really, in, in this movie, like, they literally, they sit down and have conversations with each other. And, yeah, some people felt that, you know, that's the thing. Like, when you go outside of the formula very much, some people are going to criticize it for that. And, I'm don't get me wrong, I don't think, if, if you don't like that aspect of the movie, of course, criticize it. I'm not saying you have to like that. I liked it. Not everyone does, and that's fine. The cinematography was handled by Gabriel Beristain, who also was the director of photography for Street Kings, The Ring 2, Blade Trinity, SWAT, and Blade 2. Others uh, as well, but those are the ones that I've watched. I think he did a good job on, on this. I really liked the way they filmed the action scenes where they would get excuse me, the, the camera would be very close during action scenes, making it hit harder. And I would personally say I never lost track of fights. I couldn't understand if some people felt that there were a couple of times where some of the geography and the, the placement of some of the characters involved in the action scene, that that was a little bit difficult to follow because of the camera being so close. Certainly I would say it's never a real problem for the movie. And the movie was edited by Lee Folsom Boyd, who also edited Spider-Man Far From Home, Ant-Man Total Recall, Battle Los Angeles, The Uninvited, Next, the 2005 Amityville Horror, and Man on Fire. Again, also others, but those are the ones that I've seen him do this for. And I don't like criticize. I don't think the following could really be. It's it's not a criticism of them, but I am criticized. I'm I'm 
I said I was going to be brutally honest. This is we're talking about the editing. There were there there are parts of it where you can really tell, like, a scene will imply that there will be a large crowd scene, or maybe we'll get some shots of a large crowd scene, and then it'll either end the scene or it'll cut to something else, and when it cuts back, the the crowd is is gone. And since most films are not filmed in sequence, I would guess that they filmed, like, the, the stuff with crowds that they did manage to film was maybe, like, second unit or something, and then they took, you know, yeah, and then they took a break from that and, and filmed the main, you know, with the main unit, the, the other scenes where, yeah, once COVID restrictions kicked in, they couldn't have large crowds, and so suddenly we have these awkward edits, and it's not the editor's fault, but I am criticizing editing here. That was awkward, and I mean, I suppose, so once again, not criticizing the editor, I think it might have been wise of the producers to simply say, you know what, we're going to have to delay it a little more. We're going to shoot once COVID restrictions have been lifted so that we don't have to have this all. Because I get it. They couldn't have just completely removed these scenes because some of them are critical to making the movie work. But it it is very... And, and I also understand why they didn't like, you know, ah, can't they just do the crowd with effects? There are already a ton of effects in this. The budget had been spent, the, the effects budget had been spent, and, I mean, the people making the, like, working on the effects, they put in a lot of hours, did a lot of hard work. I, I don't blame the filmmakers for not saying, okay, now also animate a huge crowd, you know. You can do crowd scenes with CG if you don't also have these massive other CG elements, and, yeah. Now, the, the sort of look that the movie emulates is a, a spy movie a la the Bourne trilogy, and there's definitely also some um, Mission Impossible, and maybe also Bond, I have to admit, it's been a very long time since I watched a Bond movie, but yeah. This, the CG, there are definitely a few times where you can really tell something is CG, but there, there are a lot of really great effects in, in the movie as well. And I was surprised by how good the de-aging was, because in the trailers, the de-aging on Ross looks bad. I don't mean like, um, it looked bad. And... In the movie, it looks good. Just plain simple, it looks good. And the, yeah, you know, the, the opening scene, it's set 20, let's see, 21 years before the rest of the movie. They had to de-age David Harbour and Rachel Weiss. You know, not, not Scarlett Johansson and Florence Pugh because they don't, you know, they're, they're played by other actors. They're played by child actors. Who do a good? I really, I just realized I forgot to comment on. They do a good job. They, they are quite convincing. I, a lot of child actors are not the, the best, and I, I don't like criticizing that because they're children. You know, like if, yeah. But, but yeah, they do a, a good job acting. And the de-aging on David Harbour and Rachel Weisz is really solid. Like, I haven't watched anything with David Harbour from, you know, it was it was 1995 the, the scene was set. But I've watched some Rachel Weisz, you know, some, some movies featuring Rachel, starring Rachel Weisz from, like, the late 90s. And, yeah, they made her look like it. And that's probably also that makes it easier, you know, if someone has, like, like, 
the when they did the de-aging, they could actually use that for reference, you know, for she she's in the first two mummy movies. I don't remember if she's in how many did they make? Three or four? I, f I forget. I'm, I'm not not counting the remake or re reboot with with Tom Cruise. But yeah, you know, and yeah, she looked very similar to the way she did in those. When they they've pretty much got it down by now. So you know, it was just the the de aging wasn't done by the time they put out those trailers with the footage of, of Ross and yeah. Now the budget was between 150 and 200 million, which is is pretty typical for one of these MCU. It's pretty well spent. The a lot of it is right up there on screen. And yeah, so they shot this in Budapest, Norway. What does that say? U UK. Morocco, Etchek in Hungary, Macon, Georgia, other UK stuff, and Los Angeles, and Santa Clarita, and, you know, a, a number of these aren't doubling for anywhere, they are, you know, they go to Budapest and Norway and, and such. But yeah, they, they use it well, like, you get a set, like, there's this there's this Russian prison and it feels cold you know it it feel like you watch it and you're like oh that's got to be incredibly like like the the kind of like the kind of heavy cold where it just if you you can't shake it you can't get it out of your body again and you know Budapest like we don't see that in every movie, so that's a really cool bit of, of exotic flavor. Now, let's see. The, right, so the action scenes, quoting here a fellow critic, this person gave it a 4 out of 10. Seeing from the trailers, the action scenes from Black Widow movie, we would have expected levels of action like Captain America and Winter Soldier. The action scenes are fun but most of them feel rushed and ultimately too short. I wish I could disagree with that, but sadly that is kind of true. Yeah, the Astrovo, yeah, like he says, most of them. And the action sequences are more grounded than any typical MCU fair, being rooted in martial arts fighting versus superpowered warfare. And yeah, and you know, fill a here. In Black Widow, she, Natasha seems to be elevated to superhuman strengths. On more than one occasion, I couldn't help drown out the voice that said, "They'd be dead after that. No way anyone is surviving that." I tried to drown out that voice. I really did, but I just couldn't. Many of the characters in Black Widow seem to be able to withstand just about anything. They're bulletproof, nightproof, and explosion proof. And, and it's 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 true, they didn't have to like Yeah. Spoiling one of the action scenes in the movie. In in Captain America, the Winter Soldier. The Winter Soldier himself blows up the car that Fury is in, and afterwards Fury has to like flee, like just crawl out of the the car and cut, you know, cut a hole in the the street and and flee. In this movie, you know, you see it in the trailer, the Taskmaster fires an explosive arrow under the car that Natasha and Yelena are in, the car explodes, flies up in the air, and lands upside down, and they just crawl out and run off like nothing happened. And, like, when I saw it in the trailer, I thought... I had kind of guessed something like that, oh, they must, like, 
jump out of the car right before it explodes or something. But no, they're inside an exploding car and they just crawl away. And yeah, no more spoilers for the time being. Shortland isn't afraid to set the camera in the middle of the fight and make the audience feel the punches being thrown rather than keeping them as spectators on the sidelines. That review gave me a 3 out of 4, and that works incredibly well for me. That was that was something I was trying to get at earlier, but uh, yeah. Johansson, Q, and Weiss create the perfect trio of complicated heroines, and David Harper offers great comic relief. Can we put the women can't direct action thing to rest? And this review gave me a 4 out of 5, and I agree. I Honestly, by now, the, the fact that there are still people saying that is ridiculous. Wonder Woman, this, and Birds of Prey, like, come on. You don't have to love these movies. But can you honestly say that the action is not well directed? I just, I don't, yeah. Natasha never seems as if she's in any danger. She never seems like she's having fun either. And another review that gave it a 2 out of 10. Another negative thing is that they were there were too many fighting scenes and they all looked alike, adding nothing to the story. And for sure, the yeah, some of them are just there because there's a, you know, there, there has to be an action scene every time so and so much time has passed. But I would definitely say this has some of the most memorable and effective action scenes in the MCU. There were multiple occasions where I legitimately did not know how an action scene was going to end, how and how the good guys, good guy or good guys, was going to win it, and they they did an incredible job on that. But but for sure, like story wise, they're they're it's, yeah they're there because the formula says that they're yeah the. The action scene types include chases, both on foot and in vehicles, martial arts fights, shootings, and gunfights. <coughs> <coughs> and let's see. So that brings us to the music and score ha handled by Lauren Bauf. See, my brain skipped ahead to saying Lauren before I said handled. Who did the music for Mission Impossible Fallout and Terminator Genesis. And yeah, he does a really good, great job in, in those and in this. And yeah, quoting fellow critic here, the music score is composed by legendary composer Lauren Balf, and he continues to make another amazing score for Black Widow. Every action scene feels more hype whenever his score is being blasted, and it's just awesome. Now, there is some black and blue comedy, and sometimes we're laughing with characters, sometimes at them. Some some of the critics said that there are too many jokes and some of them are really bad and I think an argument could be made that there should be fewer jokes and that at least a few of them are kind of meh or maybe even downright bad. And So the movie is two hours and 13 minutes long, and, you know, if you're not interested, 30 minutes in the movie probably isn't your kind of thing. And for sure, the, the last hour or so, the, yeah, the third act definitely could have been a lot better. Yeah, and, and some critics are saying the movie should be more serious, you know, less comic relief and such, given that it has themes of trauma. And another real critic gave it a 75 out of 100, saying, played, as played by Johansson, excellent here, 
Every action for Natasha is tinged with acceptance and revulsion for her own nature. Like what it becomes, kind of sternly, a movie not about franchise extension, but sisterhood, improvised families, and traumatic pasts. And another fellow critic here. The film ceases to be about Natasha wrestling with her heroism by pitting her against a raging misogynist. Black Widow tries to simplistically cast Natasha as a pop feminist icon. And yeah, that is... The, the movie would have been better without it. Now, the best element of the movie is that family, including found family, can be a source of healing or of pain. It reminded me of the Guardians of the Galaxy films, but without feeling like it was just copying it from them. It felt organic to this movie. And, yeah, you know, if you still have the chance to watch it in theaters, I would say it's worth watching in theaters at least once. It's also worth owning so that you can rewatch. You know, I realize not everyone's going to rewatch the whole thing, but I would definitely say that if you like the MCU in general, there are almost definitely parts of this that you'll want to rewatch, even if you don't rewatch the entire thing. So the worst aspect, there are a few. I, yeah, I, I had trouble picking just one. So the following are several elements that are tied for worst aspect, uh, in, in my opinion. There are a few aspects where the movie could be even better than it than it is simply by not having to adhere to MCU formula as much. It could have been stronger if it went further outside of it, even though it already does go at least a little bit outside of it. Now that Disney Plus has, you know, R-rated movies on Star, I kind of wish that they would release R-rated versions of MCU movies. They don't have to make them canon. <clears throat> and, yeah, the fact that some scenes end too quickly, in general, there's too much trimming on multiple occasions. The... See, yeah, yeah, that was what I already mentioned about the growing with mutations and the crowd scenes. But, yeah, there, there are a few scenes where, like... Yeah, you know, a scene should have gone on for at least maybe two or three minutes more. It's good, but it could be even better if it went on for longer, and it's possible that some of it was, you know, they got a lot of it filmed before Corona rolls, and then they just didn't have time, and they went ahead and released the movie, you know, without everything having been filmed. Ultimately, to me, to me, none of these are that big of a deal, but they do bother me at least somewhat. And I would say, you know, if you now, you know, if you've watched this far into this video, now that you know, you know, just lower your expectations for for that. Worst, the worst aspect, according to others, is the how bad the third act is, and for sure, it's it's it could be a lot better. Again, I don't think it's that huge of a yeah. The thing I was most worried about from reading other people's reviews was that it makes female-led action movies look bad. And the movie exceeded my expectations. I didn't think it made them look bad at all. Once again, I'm not saying there's nothing wrong with this movie, but I don't, I don't think anything in this movie... The, the things that make this movie less than what it could be are not the woke agenda or the fact that, you know, the, the fact that it's starring women. I, I get that some people don't like the fact that, you know, a, a number of the male characters are these really awful ones. I, the people who say that there are no positive male characters, okay, for one, Rick Mason, explain it to me. How is he a negative depiction of a male character? Just... Explain that one to me, because I don't see it at all. Like, he is very, very... He, he really comes in... He's... he's ah, what's the word? He really helps out the, you know, Natasha and and the the found family. Yeah, I I can't think of a single thing you... Like, they, they have this running thing where, like, Natasha is like, this is the best you could do, and he's like, I mean, I do my best. You don't give me enough time. I don't have enough money. I'm working from... 
maybe people thought he was whiny. He wasn't whiny. He he was he, he was making good points, you know. But for sure, like the the villain is almost cartoonishly misogynist. I don't think that there's in something. I I don't think it makes the movie worse that that is how it is. But for sure, like it's it's something that. I don't think it makes the movie worse. The thing that is, the, the, the problem that there is, is that by, you know, as, as you know, I already quoted a, a fellow critic pointing this out, by making the vil the main villain this raging misogynist, it's like, ah, oh, you know, she's, she's heroic for stopping him, and she is, but the movie would be better if the movie had the, the guts to be, to have her be less heroic more of an anti-hero. Now, the thing I was most looking forward to was Natasha getting her own story, and the movie exceeded my expectations. Once again, not saying everything about it is perfect, but it does really add to her character, and I really, I completely, like, in the, in the other movies, where, you know, she's, she's a, an Avenger for most of the movies that she's in, and though she is clearly, she, she's, relieved to be working for the good guys she's relieved to that there are people who have her back but there's still this sense that like i don't know if this is going to last forever and i can't like you know she she tells bruce you know like, yeah age of ultron bruce is like well, what what did this guy do to you that was so bad not a damn thing but never say never She's always ready for things to, for, for her to lose the people that she cares about. And watching this movie, like the, the first chunk of the movie where we see her childhood, a bit of her childhood, you can really understand why, you know. So, I yeah. And I am definitely interested in more by director Kate Shortland. In some ways, the movie is somewhat draining to watch. There's there's a lot of tragic elements, and when the movie really leans into them, it's yeah, it really it really gets to you. I I what was the word? I I think one one fellow critic said that some of Yelena's scenes were soul crushing, for for you know intentionally so, and yeah, very much so. like. I'm really glad that she is in the MCU and, you know, it's not a spoiler. Okay, okay technically, yeah. Spoiler for this movie and the Hawkeye miniseries. Yelena is going to appear in that. I don't know exactly how much yet, but she's definitely going to appear in it. You know, she's been confirmed as cast in that. No more spoilers for this movie for the time being. The movie definitely leaves some unanswered questions, and some of them would have been nice to have answered, and some of the mysteries there are answers to, and some of the mysteries that there aren't answers to would have been nice to, to yeah. And the trailers and TV spots do give at least a little bit too much away, but I will say that, you know, I chose not to continue watching the new ones after the movie premiered, just in case, just in case that they gave, because they did, like, you know, the Age of Ultron, one of the TV spots that came out after the movie premiered, gave away that in the Hulk, the Hulkbuster scene, Tony hits the Hulk so hard that Hulk spits out a tooth, and then Tony says, I'm sorry, I don't think you should know that before going to watch that movie, and thankfully I didn't, you know, and I think I said in that review that, you know, oh, some people said it gave everything away, and it definitely didn't for that scene, and, you know, yeah, if you watched, if you only got to watch the movie after seeing that TV spot, that bit was spoiled, and that's too bad, but that really sucks. I, I hope people, I hope marketing gets better at not giving too much away, but, yeah, if you don't watch market, you know, TV spots and trailers released after the movie came out, then there's definitely still some really great stuff that wasn't spoiled. 
They the two spots and trailers give it a good job selling the movie. If you like the two spots and trailers, you will like the movie, and if not, you won't, or you're less likely to. Cover the cover and poster do not give too much away, but they do give a good idea of what the movie's like. So once again, if you like the cover and poster, you'll you're more likely to like the movie than if you don't like them. The movie does not have a lot of metaphors. The some of the spy stuff you you do have to pay close attention to pick up on everything, but it's not like difficult to understand as such. And let's see. So yeah, I sometimes talk about whether there's any, for example, 9/11 porn in these movies. Honestly, I can't offer. Yes, yes, there is. Yes, sadly, you know I I. I put in my notes probably before watching the movie, and yeah, I, I not every single one of them, but a lot of the MCU movies have 9/11 porn. And can we just not and say we did? Because I don't, I, I don't think it was ever a good thing. But for sure, it's like, let's just, yeah, let's just not. Now, when I looked on Rotten Tomatoes, this had an 80%, what's it called, critics score, and the, it was, that was based on 371 reviews and a 92% audience score, and let's see. The, yeah, based on over 5,000 verified ratings. And the critics' consensus is Black Widow's deeper themes are drowned out in all the action, but it remains a solidly... entertaining standalone adventure that's rounded out by a stellar supporting cast. And the audience, I'm, I'm glad they've done, they've started doing this now, because really, you know, a, a number of times the audience disagrees with the critics. So, audience says, Black Widow serves up another savory helping of the blockbuster Marvel formula with a fun family dynamic and an extra character development in the midst of all the action. So, just in case, I want to check, yeah. Right now, it is 81% on the Tomato Major, based on 381 reviews, and 92% audience score based on 10,000 plus verified ratings, and yeah, so it is certified fresh. So we now have several female-led superhero, uh, or comic book adaptation movies that are certified fresh. The Wonder Woman, the first solo Wonder Woman movie is also certified fresh. I forget if Captain Marvel is, so I will just real quick. This is really not, huh, that's weird. It doesn't seem to list, no, it's gotta be there. But yeah, here we go. And it is 79%. So yeah, we now have three female-led. What about Birds of Prey? I gotta stop doing this. Okay, so this will definitely be the last of them that I look up. But we have at least three verified, fresh, and yeah, four. Because Birds of Prey is also, so yeah. On Metacritic, it has a critic rating of 67 point 67 out of 100 is what I meant to say and a user score of 6.5 out of 10 and let's see and and yeah last I checked there was user reviews recent as the 17th of you know of July and there are 55 minutes when, when I checked 55 Metacritic reviews 203 user reviews, and on IMDb, it currently, or when I checked, it has 6.9 out of 10, and 
1,748 user reviews and 261 reviews via the external reviews section. This has more blood and like bloody wounds and such than I've seen in in any previous PG-13 or uh, any previous MCU movie and yeah also it's also unusual for PG-13 but other than that it isn't really yeah you know the the language and sexuality and such it doesn't go way beyond let's see I suppose I An argument could be made that it is excessive and gratuitous in the amount of trauma suffered by female characters in it, that that is basically almost like emotional porn, and it's supposed to make us even more excited about seeing the bad guy be defeated. They didn't have to go as far as they did. But again, the fact that it's there is, is a good thing. Is makes the movie better. Now, I recommend this to fans of the MCU leading up to this point, especially fans of Black Widow, the character, and her mythology. And, you know, yeah, if, if, you, if you want to watch this at home, you can watch it on Disney+. Plus and I... Let's see. I'm not entirely sure if there are a lot of special features yet, but based on the other MCU movies, there probably will be, like, they, you know, on, on Disney+, Plus, they have commentary tracks for the entirety of, if I recall, both Infinity War and Endgame by the directors, and I think also the writers, so it's, you know, yeah, I, I could definitely see how you know, if you don't already have Disney Plus, but you like this movie and you want extras, you you there may well be extras for it in the future. And as far as I know, the only place you can stream it, you know, legally right now is Disney Plus. And please don't stream it illegally. It, you know, don't don't pirate movies in general. And and this one definitely deserves your your money. You know, instead of wait, you know, if you wait, let's see, what is it, four months, six months, or something, it will be free on Disney Plus. But it it deserves, yeah. If you're at all interested in the movie, I I would say, yeah. You know, based on what I've said in the video up to this point, so I give this seven supportive spy family members out of ten, and that brings us into the spoiler section or sections I suppose so yeah first spoiler section is thought section start disclaimers if you don't care about these disclaimers I try to keep them short and relevant but your mileage may vary you can skip right ahead to the section of your choice via the description box I often try to talk very fast during the disclaimer since a lot of it is very standard information I'm not going to keep speaking as fast as sometimes do during this section once I get into the rest of the video itself. With that said, please do note that some of the specific discussion I'm going may be in this section. Everyone this video as well. I'm going to do what I can to make it worth your time. So, yeah, from here on out, spoilers for this movie, in addition to the spoilers for the earlier entries in the MCU, including possibly the Disney Plus shows. I really... I'm glad that this was made as a prequel, that they didn't try... Obviously, it would be great if this had come out. Is it a little slow? It's a little slow, but it looks like it's still picking up everything I'm saying. So, yeah. I'm really glad that, uh, yeah, obviously it would have been better if this had come out like 2016 or thereabouts. But I'm really glad that they did fill in some blanks between, you know, honestly, it could have been pretty much the same movie if they had made it back then. But, yeah, the... Let's see, the, the one thing was the, the thing with how, yeah, 
you know, how she trusts. She, she kind of has difficult time, Natasha has a difficult time deciding whether she trusts the, the people who are supposed to have her back or not. And, you know, now that we know that that's literally, you know, like for, for three years as a child, she had a family and then she was in the Red Room for, for years. So, yeah. The, the rest of this video is not a review, it's a series of well, thoughts, some is analysis, some is MSP career for tech on other jokes, riff tracks and other jokes, and yeah, so the time codes for the sections are in the description box. The section right after this is thoughts I have while watching in chronological order. You can think of the running commentary, live tweeting, or the like. And the section after that is thoughts I had before watching. So let's see that. Might be it for... Oh, right. Does the movie appear to have empathy for the least likable characters? It doesn't for Dracov, but it does for Melina, who kept working for the Red Room. And that is... I, th I think the movie would be better if there at the end of the movie, they kind of, like... Some people have said that they wished that Nata that they, you know, Melina and maybe also Alexei had been arrested by Ross. I don't know if I'd go that far, but I think it would be great if the if they completely allowed the weight to be felt of the fact that, yeah, Melina for years helped the Red Room. She's victimized a lot of these young women. I don't know if maybe, let's say, let's see, maybe there should be like a thing of, actually, yeah, maybe, maybe arrest, actually, yeah, think, thinking about it, like, they're near the end, and let's see, yeah, they're near the end, the, the, you know, Melina, is about to leave, you know, she, she, like, you, you can tell from her body language, she's about to leave, and, you know, she, she talks to Natasha, and she says, like, yeah, maybe, maybe have it be that Yelena and Alexei, they leave, and Natasha and Melina, yeah, Natasha says, I have to, there's something important I have to say to Melina before she joins the rest of you. And when she says before she joins the rest of you, we think, oh, she's going to let her go. But no, what she actually means is Melina is not going to join the rest of you before she served time in prison. She has to learn that what she did was awful. She has to never do it again. And, you know, she has to be scared straight. Whether you believe that's a thing and whether that works in real life or not, you know, I, I think the movie should invoke that idea. But, but yeah, you know, she says that, so we see them leave, and, you know, Melina says, you know, Melina, like, looks around and says, you know, Ross is going to be here any minute, and if I'm still here when he gets here, I'm not going to see the outside of a prison for maybe 25 years. And Natasha says, I know. And then she, like, lifts her, her, you know, she does the wrist zappy thing to, to, like, stun Melina. And as she's lying there, Natasha tells her, I, you can't be trusted right now. You, you know, the, even without Dracov, I can't be sure you're not going to victimize other young girls. You know, and, and that's the last we see of her, you know, and, and yeah. Ross arrives, and Natasha isn't there anymore, but Melina still is, and, you know, that, that kind of thing. But, let's see, that is basically, yeah, you know, all four members of the, the found family, the movie has empathy for them, despite the awful things they've done. And... I suppose that... Yeah. So that brings us to 
the next section entitled Notes Taken Before Launching. Nope, while watching. Here we go. Notepad time. I really liked, you know, when, when we see Natasha and Yelena as children, they're very sweet together, and the, yeah, you know, the, the thing with how they actually crawl around like actual spiders, and the, the thing with, you know, we're both upside down, I bet you're gonna fall first, and then there at the end, we're both upside down again, and the, the whistling to, to greet each other, and then the whistling to say goodbye to each other there at the end of the movie. And I thought the movie did a good job exploring. I already mentioned the review, the, the theme of pain makes you stronger. I, I like how the, the, you know, Natasha, in response to the pain and trauma, has kind of shut off emotions. So she doesn't really, she doesn't let herself feel very many emotions. And she's not, like, she's not a very happy person where Yelena has basically adopted a sense of humor. She's sarcastic to, to cope with trauma. And I don't know if I was reading into it, but I kind of got the sense that, like, Natasha wasn't shown enough affection and, and love. I don't know, maybe it's just that she sees the writing on the wall. Certainly when Alexei comes home and he's, like, whispering to Melina, this is it, you know, Natasha immediately picks up on it, where Yelena is like, ah, road trip, you know, and, but, but even before that, I kind of got the sense that the, yeah, now, I, I got the sense that Natasha liked being with Yelena more than she liked being with their, their parents, and I, I think I'm just gonna be referring to them as if they're actual biological relatives, instead of saying found family all over and over. And, yeah, we, we say that, you know, in, in 1995 in Ohio, they were, in the opening, they were basically a sleeper cell. I have to admit, I really, maybe this was something that was supposed to be filmed, but then, you know, COVID restrictions prevented it. I would have liked to see what it was that Alexei did that led to him being in prison for all those decades. I, I kind of felt like, I, you know, I think he says something like, oh, you know, I criticized, I criticized the, the communist movement and I, you know, so, something, but I kind of, like, maybe if there had been a thing of, like, he, he lost this super important battle or something, but, yeah. The, the opening action scene was incredibly gripping throughout the scene there are a lot of times where it looks like the family won't be able to stay together and it's this thing of like it's like a classic tragedy we know that they're not going to stay together cuz that's not the you know we we know that Natasha entered the red room as a child she didn't have a normal childhood after that so you know, whatever exactly has happened before the events that we see at the start of the movie, we know that, you know, by the end of the, the opening, she's going to end up in the Red Room, and, you know, Yelena must also. And I, I just, the scene after scene where I was like, this is it, this is, they're going to be, and, and it was just, it was devastating. Like, I didn't real. I, I wasn't sure Alexei was going to make it on the plane with them. I, I thought that maybe that's how he ends up in, in prison. You know, he was, he got caught by S.H.I.E.L.D. and then like extradited, maybe, yeah, like extradited in, uh, to, to trade a, a political prisoner or something, you know. And then the Russians were so pissed off at him for the extradition being necessary that they threw him in prison as well, but, you know, and, and, like, when, when Alexei is on the plane, and he's, like, firing the rifle at cars, I, I thought it was incredibly compelling.
and the the teen spirit cover works really well. The the red room hits really hard. The the opening credit sequence where we see the the red room. Yeah, and we see the like SWAT attacking Natasha. I like the wit between Natasha and Ross, and you know then we see. It was just a, a fake out. Natasha was hidden. You know, or wait, she was she was on a ferry. We thought that they had caught up to her, but she left behind the, the tracking device. I was not completely prepared for Yelena stabbing another Black Widow in the gut like that. Holy crap! I mean, she and she twist. Didn't she twist the blade? I think she twisted the blade. Holy crap, that was like, and, and yeah, we don't see the blood because it's PG-13. That's still really brutal. And then, you know, the, the gas uh, frees her from the control. I, I really like the fights between Taskmaster and the Found Family. I, I really wasn't sure how Natasha was going to, like... I, th I was sitting there thinking, how is Natasha going to defeat Taskmaster? You know, what, the, the first time they meet. And it was like, oh, I mean, sh she doesn't. She just she, she gets away because she gets into the water. And it's like, how are you going to trace her through the water? You know, you can't, like, scan for it. Not if she's far enough down. And, like, yeah, she could, she could have swum in any direction. You know, left, right, forward, back any direction so Taskmaster has no way of following her but that was and and that was also like uh, yeah okay so spoiling the start of the born supremacy you know when Marie is killed by you know um, Carl Urban he, he's he's he thought he was shooting born but you know because they just switch places and and Bourne stays underwater for a while, and and Carl Urban leaves. So that was like how with Taskmaster. Yeah, no more spoilers for the Bourne supremacy. And just in general, yeah, like, I mean, other than the final fight, did Natasha ever defeat? She defeated she defeated Taskmaster at the very very end. And she gets the mask off and, and uses the gas on her. But other than that, didn't I think she... Did she win when they were... Right after she let her out of the cell, maybe? I'm, I'm not 100%. Uh, I really liked Natasha using the, the grappling hook. You know, I... Uh, I think I might have already mentioned in another video. The, the Just Cause 3 definitely takes some inspiration from... The the yeah, Captain America, the Winter Soldier, and this one really, you know, I, I knew from the trailers that this one had some Just Cause 3 stuff. And I'll talk about that in the next section, but when she uses a grappling hook, let's see, she she used it to get up to the, the beam and then, like, get the case... Or wait, maybe not the case, but the contents of the case. Of the, yeah, very, very just cause three. And I like the car chase through Budapest. I I really thought that it worked well with the again, like the moment I saw that massive like, it's not a tank, but it's like an armored personnel carrier or something. You see it, and it's like plowing through, you know, it, it's shoving other cars aside. It's knocking down, like, those poles that are supposed to stop cars. You know, I was like, how are they going to get away from this thing? Like, and, and I mean, they kind of didn't. They, they got, like, a shortcut that it couldn't follow through. But then that other Black Widow on a motorcycle came, and then and eventually it did catch up to them and blew up the car and then the, you know they're explosion proof which makes it a little less and you know the two sisters snap at each other they make some really nasty comments and such and you see these you know wounds and and bleeding you really feel 
like the pain lasts in this movie. You know, the family who steal cars together stay together. I, I did kind of like that, like, at first, she's like, she she's kind of like Steve Rogers. She's like, you can't steal a car, you know. Or, or wait, no, other way around. You know, and that one, it was like, where did Captain America learn to steal a car? And here, she's like, you can't steal a car. Which I guess is actually kind of a thing, because she's like the bigger sister. She's the older sister. So she's like, you know, trying to make sure that her sister behaves herself. And then later, she's the one who's dealing, you know, or she she fully agrees to steal the car. Because they were paying attention to that other guy, and he hid the keys somewhere, and they spotted it. I liked Alexei arm wrestling in the Russian prison. And the, the prison escape bit was, was good, other than the bit where, like... There's this bit where, like, he looks in three different directions, and all three have, like, crowds. And then it cuts away, and the next time we see him, nowhere, no, no crowds nearby. So that was a bit like, okay, I, I, I think it was Corona restriction rules. That, that, that I, I figured there was supposed to be a scene where maybe, like, a bunch of them come really close to him, and maybe he, like, picks up one and throws into a, a pile so they all fall down and you know that that kind of moves like that to give himself some space and that actually yeah yeah maybe he does i think they were coming at him from three different directions maybe he does that in two different directions and then he turns into the third and the other and the crowd they were running at him but then they like stop and they're like kind of scared of him because they look at the other you know the piles of dead people and he goes like rah you know and then they run off and and that means that he has space again. Yeah. Let's see. And yeah, once it, Natasha and Yelena, you know, free Alexei, then we see all three of them are, you know, make make nasty comments at each other. The the you know, and and we we get this really graphic description of the the forced hysterectomy which yeah I, I really appreciate you know it, it is this thing of like I don't know why apparently to some men this you know some men don't really think it's a big deal but like reproductive rights are a major like very recently the Republicans made made abortion almost illegal they, they Let's see, I think it was after six weeks, you can't get an abortion. And a lot of women don't even realize they're pregnant by then. You know, like, let me think. I think it's it, it's every four weeks you're supposed to get your period. You know, if you, if you miss your period by one, yeah, if you miss it by two weeks, then it's too late for an abortion, according to the new law. If you miss it by one week, you know, not every single woman ha can afford to go and get a proper pregnancy test every time they miss their period by a week. So sometimes that just happens. There's a little, uh, yeah. And and here we have a movie where it says where where they directly say it is awful when men take away a woman's right to to choose whether to have children and and this kind of thing so i i thought that was really great i liked how every time we meet a a member of the found family there's violence like the alexei doesn't attack the the his two daughters but there is violence and you know he he does engage in violence to for them to before the the jailbreak but the first time Natasha meets Yelena, they have a fight. The first time that they, you know, when they catch up to Melina, I was sitting there thinking, you know, she, she gets out this massive sniper. And I'm sitting there thinking, please notice Alexei, please notice Alexei. Because she can recognize Alexei. But the other two, I mean, I, I, wait, has she still worked with... Yelena, because Yelena was a Black Widow until recently. No, it's, it's I, I think, based on Yelena, I, it sounded like she hadn't seen her in a long time. Anyway, 
you know, I'm, I'm sitting there worried that she's going to accidentally, you know, maybe not kill, but wound one of her, you know, daughters. So, and, and you know, both when we meet Yelena and when we meet Melina, like, very soon after we meet them, we see this shot of, like, a wall behind them of just all these guns. And it literally is, like, their background involves a lot of violence, and they are constantly prepared for more violence. And it just really, like, how can you have a family when every moment you're you're ready for, in any moment now, there's going to be a massive fight. And, you know, not long after they do meet back up, the, the you know, Melina tells Natasha, I've already alerted the Red Room. You know, and I thought that was a, a good fake out too. You know, when she says that, and then it cuts back, and you see Natasha lying there unconscious, and you think that Melina knocked her out, but in reality, you know, it, it had been maybe two or three minutes with Yelena and yeah, Yelena and Alexei together. But and and you know, they do like Melina did allow for Alexei to be trained, which. They were worried that they wouldn't be able to convince him of the plan, so they just allowed the Red Room to train him. They, they weren't going to kill him. They'd rather be able to control him. And, you know, once the once Dracov pulls off the mask, you realize that Melina, you know, when, when it cut back and you saw Melina, uh, you know, still conscious and Natasha unconscious, in reality, you know, Melina was actually Natasha posing and vice versa and and you know melina posing as natasha probably wasn't unconscious they just in those couple of minutes you know after melina said i alerted the red room then she was like here's the i but i have a plan i i didn't betray you i have a plan here's the plan they talk about it and later it flashes back to that i, I thought that worked really well and yeah, the, the found family at times sweet, at times very sad. The pig being made to not breathe and almost dying, like, I get it. They thought that it would be like a, an edgy, darkly comical way to show how effective this, you know, the, the mind control thing is. I'm not the first to say that was really messed up. Don't, don't make a good guy character do something like that if you're not going to then have them like be arrested or some kind of or or like trying to make a heroic sacrifice to to save the others something like that you know but you can't don't do that and then don't have any consequences and no heroic sacrifice nothing at the end of the movie and, I, you know, we're told Natasha's real biological mom never stopped looking for her and was eventually executed for it. So that was really, yeah, just so, so crushing. And Alexei sings American Pie to Yelena. He didn't, he never forgot how much she loves that song and he never forgot the lyrics. Now, maybe he has an easy time remembering like, do we know if that's a thing for the Super Soldier Serum? I'm, I'm not entirely sure, but, like, he's been in this Russian prison. Was he in the Russian prison for all 21 years? I'm not entirely sure, but, you know, for, for a really, for, for many, many years. And I, I would definitely say I get the sense that he's been there for at least 15 years. And, yeah, he never forgot. And, and I, maybe it's just me, but I, I think to myself trying to, I'm not going to make the reference, but to me, in my head canon, every, you know, every so often he would, he would feel lonely, he would feel sad, he would be sitting there alone in his cell, and he would maybe like close his eyes and maybe hum it to him. I, I figure he probably wouldn't sing it to, you know, other prisoners were here, but Maybe hum it to himself, maybe just go over the lyrics in his mind and, and close his eyes and think of his daughter. You know, so I, I thought that was really sweet. And, and it was a great kind of, like, you thought that, 
like it for for a lot of his screen time it seems like he just can't really relate to them he doesn't know how to talk to them anymore you know he makes that awful joke about you know are you on your period and and then he's like oh you can't tell me about a hysterectomy well i mean you just made a joke about her being on her period and you know that she like he knows what the red room is he he knows that they had this done to them and and that is, you know, a, th a thing. It's like it's showing that some men really don't think about these things. And the, but but yeah, you know. So for for a long time, it seems like he just doesn't really, he doesn't know how to relate to his daughters. But he does still really care about them, as seen through seeing the American flag. I. Some people didn't really think that the the red room being like up in the air kept it hidden enough. I mean, they maybe should have had like cloaking technology. I mean, I mean, I don't think it's said specifically that they don't have it, but I think it might have been good to have them specifically say that they do have it. But I I thought it made sense as this thing of how they keep it hidden because it's like, I mean, if it's still if they know. It, it seems like something that, you know, for example, S.H.I.E.L.D. would spend a lot of resources trying to find. They would probably scour uh, the Soviet Union for it. And, and really, once the Soviet Union collapsed, I mean, wouldn't they just, like, try to make a deal with, like, the Russian... Let me think. Do Russia have presidents? Premier ministers? Prime Minister, I, I forget, but, you know, the, the leader of the Russian nation, to say, you know, if you give us the Red Room, we'll give you a really advantageous trading agreement with America. And in that, in, you know, I think it's possible, now that we know that it was flo a, a floating, the, the Red Room was floating for all these years, I, th I think they might have tried to, to convince. And... You know, the, the Russian leader would say, you know what, I don't know exactly where it is. You're free to look anywhere. I, you know, mi casa es su casa. Find it, shut it down. I hate it. It's giving my people a bad name. I don't want anything to do with it. And they scoured and they couldn't find it. And it was, you know, I, I, don't they basically say in the movie that it was a direct response to the fact that Natasha did know where it was. And she's like, you know, she tried to blow it up. So, you know, Drake was like, okay, if she finds it, she's going to blow it up. So we got to keep her from finding it again. And they were going to cut out Yelena's brain. That was really yikes. But, but yeah, you know, they, they really don't think of these, you know, of the women that they use in the Red Room, they don't think of them as human beings. They think of them as lab rats. You know, I mean, I mean, that's the thing. Like, hypothetically, let's say that you were running an experiment with, like, yeah, lab rats or guinea pigs or something. And one of them was, like, able to do a thing that you didn't expect it to. You know, I mean, I'd like to think that you'd maybe wait for it to die of natural causes anyway rather than putting it down. But, you know, I, you know, once it's dead... Yeah, you know, like examining its brain makes a lot of sense, but they're gonna they're gonna kill this like she's maybe thirty or not even thirty. And and yeah, they're they're gonna kill her and look at you know, examine her brain after that just because they it, it would help them in their and she used to be one of them, but that's how little they that they care. Now, but but yeah, I thought you know Melina actually being Natasha in disguise, like in Captain America: The Winter Soldier. I thought it was a, a decent callback as a, you know, and and let's see, was it the the pitch meetings? You know, Ryan George of pitch meetings, and once again, every I, I think a lot of what he says makes sense, and he's certainly funny. He's very very funny. Occasionally, he'll he'll like try to make a point and. I just don't quite agree with it. And he said, you know, wouldn't it make more sense for Melina to just be, you know, why why did Natasha have to pose as Melina? And he makes the point that, you know, 
Natasha hasn't seen Melina in, in many, many years, and now she's going to pose as her in front of a guy who sees her, you know, every so often. I agree that it's it's a very risky endeavor, but Natasha, like, you know, she is an expert at interrogation, and she she does the, you know, like with, with Loki, thank you for your cooperation. And we find out the Taskmaster is Drakov's daughter. It was actually, I, you know, for, for many, many years, I always assumed that, yeah, you know, yeah, Natasha did something awful to Drakov's daughter. And then I, I didn't, I, for, for a while, I wasn't really aware that Drakov, is it that in the comics? I'm not 100% sure. The Drakov runs the Red Room, in, in this movie at least. But the moment that I, you know, saw the, the Wikipedia for cast for this and saw that there's a character named Drakov in this, I was like, so he wants revenge for what happened to his daughter. And then I actually saw, like, someone on, on YouTube said that, oh, you know, when Loki said, can you wipe out that much red, Drakov's daughter, he was saying, you're Drakov's daughter because you were th went through the Red Room run by Drakov, so you're, you know, yeah, and as Drakov's daughter, you did awful things, but, you know, apparently it was actually, he was referring to the person, the individual Drakov's daughter, and, you know, the, the, ah, uh, Drakov, you know, we find out about the, the pheromones, which, to me, just reeks of Directive 4, which just, yeah. And seriously, I was going to make that reference even before watching the the uh, Brad Jones review of, of this movie. I, I did think of the, it did remind me of Robocop 1, even, you know, without seeing his video. I, yeah. And, you know, Drakov traps uh, Melina, and Natasha takes some hits, and Natasha taking hits, you know, in part, it's the, it's, it's that she needs, she needs her nose broken for the, you know, but it is, again, also this thing of, like, a misogynist, you know, they, they basically, they make him do all the misogynist things. He takes away women's reproductive rights. He kidnaps young children, small, small children, young girls. He breaks down the, you know, the identity of women so that he can control them better. He hits women. And let's see. And, and with Yelena, he's willing to, to, you know. Okay, so yeah, this is not very common, thankfully, but, you know, he's willing to cut up a woman that used to work for him and he was you know I'm pretty sure he was very happy with how you know her working for him until the the gas deprogrammed her so yeah they 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 hit the every every what's it called point every every aspect where he could be a misogynist in one way or another they they tried to hit all of them and I don't think it was quite necessary I I, again, I think it's the the female empowerment thing, and I'm for I'm all for female empowerment. I don't think they needed to to have all of them, yeah. And she breaks her own nose, which was a disturbing but badass moment. And we see Natasha fighting multiple widows. I really love the the heist heist scene editing for the climax. How it'll cut back to to Melina explaining things to Natasha before the the Red Room people arrived and took possession of all four uh, the family members and Yelena is able to deprogram all the widows with a grenade with the gas I like that in this movie every good guy has a dark edge to them and I do wish that there were more consequences for it and Natasha manages to use the gas to deprogram Antonia. I mean, that is slightly cute. In in the comics, it's Tony Masters who's Taskmaster, and here it's an Antonia 
who becomes Taskmaster. You know, although her last name isn't Masters, but that's still, it's, you know, I, I forget who it was, but someone on YouTube pointed out that's as if, you know, that's that's like if if Steve Rogers' name was Steve Americas, you know. So yeah, it's it's kind of a, a silly. It's 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 a comic book thing, you know. The the ah, what's the word? Yeah, they'll they'll give them names that sound like what, what was what was the Joker's name? Jack Napier becomes Joker. You know, it's yeah, it's it's silly, and and Harleen Quinzel becomes Harley Quinn. Harley Quinn. But but yeah, um, let's see what was the th yeah. So I'm just I'm briefly going to be spoiling the end of X Men Two. I like that in this movie, unlike X Men Two. At the end, the hero is able to deprogram the mind-controlled, you know, yeah, the the villain right-hand woman, and both of them. Instead of there being, in, instead of an ending with the hero killing them. Excuse me. No more spoilers for X Men Two. I like that she was able to save her, but you know. That's an area where I definitely agree with the the pitch meeting. She still almost, you know, she she thought she killed a child. She intentionally did something that she thought would kill a child. And afterwards she talks about it like collateral damage. And I'd also, it didn't feel, it did, I get why she would call it collateral damage back then. But today, like today, 2016, she still just like, I, I just felt... I think what it should have been was that Yelena, I, th I think it's Yelena who says, you, you killed, you know, I, I think Natasha should have basically just shut down and like tried to have a, uh, what's the word? Um, try to, try to change the subject or something. And Yelena keep pressing her on it, and Natasha just can't handle it. You know, just snaps at her or something like that. And I, I don't. Again, I don't necessarily think that it's wrong to write something so so edgy for a character that we are supposed to be on the side of. But I think maybe there at the end. Let's see. What's the word? What would be a good way to do that? Yeah, there at the end, after Natasha has deprogrammed Antonia. Yeah, like right after she's done that, then like Antonia like hits her in the yeah, like like she she punches her right in the face, maybe rebreaking her nose, and. You know, and and then Natasha like holding her her now bleeding nose, and as as much blood as as the PG thirteen rating would allow, and she's like, I th I thought the gas would deprogram you, and Antonia says it did. That was that was for trying to kill me, you know, and and maybe Natasha starts to try to explain, but I, it was the only way that I could stop Dracov. You know, and and yeah, and maybe she says something like, you know, I I I didn't have a choice. And then, you know, and yeah, and and then Antonia says, that's exactly what. It, uh, let's see. Um. Yeah. Let's let's see. Um. Right, right. She then, then she says something like, Dracov took away our choices, but you did have a choice. And you, you made the wrong one, you know, like, and, and maybe straight out come out and say, I know that thanks to you, now I can make my, you know, now I have my freedom again. But I will never stop hating you for trying to kill me. You know, some something like that that really hits hard. And that could also be like 
then when we see her sacrifice herself in Endgame, you know, we think maybe she's that that's one of the things she's trying to make amends for where the way it played out in the movie now i kind of don't think that that is something that really motivated her there because she she kind of she already did resolve that you know yeah she almost killed her when she was a child but now she gave her her freedom back and the movie kind of treats it like yeah i i don't know that's that's how i see it and that was it for all the, the scenes from the main movie. And then we have the post credit scene with Val setting up the Hawkeye miniseries with, you know, recruit, uh, not recruiting. She already recruited Yelena. So I guess Yelena might have been working for Val for, for years, since 2016 or something. And, you know, she tells her, how would you like a shot at the guy who killed your sister? And, you know, shows her the Hawkeye. So, so you know, maybe she's there to kill Hawkeye in the miniseries. Maybe she's just there to, like... You know, I, I saw a theory that she's there to turn him. Would she really be saying, would you like a shot... How would you like a shot at the man who killed your sister? If it's just recruit... But anyway, maybe. But I think she's either going to be there to kill him... Or at least to keep an eye on him. Maybe make sure that he doesn't... Like, he's he's one of the only remaining living Avengers. You know, maybe she has someone watching every living, surviving member of the Avengers. You know, on the, the ones on Earth, which... I mean... Yeah, so so basically... I don't know, is, is Scott Lang an official member? The original. The, the original team... Basically, it's only Bruce or uh, Professor Hulk. It's Professor Hulk and Hawkeye are basically the only surviving members of the original team who are on Earth. I, or, uh, I guess it's possible that Thor is going to be on Earth for at least some of the four, four movies. Yeah, anyway. I, I thought it was a, uh, an excellent post credit scene I'm really, really excited to see. And I, I like... I get the sense that the scene was at least slightly different, maybe longer originally, but then now that she was introduced on the Disney Plus show, Captain America and the Winter Soldier, she... you know, that's... there she said her full name, so we didn't need her to do that here. But I could imagine that originally she had at least a little bit more, maybe, maybe not. And anyway, that brings us to the final section entitled, just a second, notes taken before watching. So, in this movie, we saw more than the short flashback in Age of Ultron of the Red Room training ground for Black Widows, not to be confused with the Trapuke Sib, the training ground for Yellow Brats. And, let's see... Yeah, just very briefly, I suppose I'm happy that, there was, that Ross wasn't in that much of the movie, because there really wouldn't have been space for him. But the fact that he's only there at the very start and then the very end, I don't know. I, I He didn't really need to be... I mean, he doesn't even accomplish anything, really. There at the start, it I guess it establishes that she's effective at being on the run from the law. But there at the end, does he even arrest any... He, he doesn't arrest any of the four family members. So, yeah. I like that, yeah, so I took some notes from the, the trailers. I like that Natasha and Yelena fought each other and they used the same moves. I've, I've seen some people say, well, why did they fight each other? Well, for one thing, neither of them knew with absolute certainty that the other wasn't there to kill them. Like, last Natasha knew, Yelena was a Black Widow, you know. By the end of the fight, they... they both accept that the other one isn't trying to 
killed them because they just got done trying to kill each other. Uh, yeah. Yeah, you know, but actually, yeah, I suppose for much of that fight, they both thought the other one would try to kill them, so they tried to kill the other, and then there at the end, right, you know, as they're trying to kill the other, both of them agree, we, we you know, let's let's stop trying to kill each other. I, I forget, did, did they cry uncle or say, I give, I give, I, I don't remember, but, but yeah, you know, that way they know, well, okay, the other one really must not be trying to kill me, or they would have finished the job. But the but but yeah, you know, it's it and it tells the audience that they really do have the same training. They really do like it's it's important to establish that Yelena is as formidable as Natasha is. And it is this thing of like, well, if you're if you're not able to kill me, why you know, Yelena probably thinks if Natasha isn't here to kill me, why didn't she come by years ago to rescue me from the Red Room? And she you know yeah, she she says, well, I thought the Red Room was, was done, and I, th what did she say? I thought you didn't want to, you wouldn't want to see me, or something like that. But she does later say, I should have come back to you. And Natasha knows that Yelena, she doesn't know that Yelena has been deprogrammed. You know, she, be yeah, I mean, I guess, does she know what the gas, th she doesn't know what the gas does, she just knows the Taskmaster wants it. And she, she has a, I mean, she does basically know that Yelena is responsible for Natasha having the, the gas, but she doesn't know yet exactly. Yeah, and, and Yelena is like, well, I thought you were going to give the gas to the Avengers so that, like, Tony and Bruce could, you know, invest, you know, check, check it and, and mass produce it or, or something. So, so she's like, well, the only reason Natasha would come here instead of go talk to the Avengers about it is if she's evil now. I thought it made perfect sense that they fought. Let's see. Yeah, so here we go. In part of the trailer, Black Widow is seen in Freefall. This immediately reminded me of Freefall in the Just Cause games. I believe this is an intentional reference. Just Cause 3 tipped their hat at the MCU, and this is the MCU tipping the hat right back at the Just Cause franchise. For those who don't know, among the various things you can do Just Cause that are reminiscent of various superhero abilities, including Spider-Man, Iron Man, and Batman, Just Cause 3 has a DLC called Sky Fortress, and it is very clearly heavily inspired by the climax of Captain America 2, The Winter Soldier, the Falcon flying bits. I absolutely love it, and I'm very glad to see the MCU responding like this. And I was actually, I was a little surprised by, there are several bits of the trailers of, of action scenes that just aren't in the final film and I I figure it's probably again like they they weren't able to finish it because of uh, Corona and and they they had filmed some of the action scenes and they figured they'd be able to finish when they made those trailers and let's see here. And right, and various people had theorized as to who Taskmaster would be, including Hawkeye. As someone else pointed out, he was on house arrest during this, you know. Point in, in time, but and and some had guessed that it would turn out to be Melina, but then a trailer came out where Melina helps Alexei fight Taskmaster. Now let's see. And yeah, and I noted here. Captain America 2 and 3 and Iron Man 2 are no, Captain America 2 and Iron Man 2 are the only Black Widow MCU movies not to have superhumans, at most super soldiers. And I was wondering if this would have any, and it doesn't. You know, the there's the Alexei with the super soldier serum, and then there's the ability of, of Taskmaster to memorize moves and such. But you know, yeah, you don't have like Thor, for example. Or someone with those kinds of powers. 
with, with superpowers. I I know some people really didn't like that Taskmaster didn't have the abilities that it was this like chip or something in in I thought that made more sense than the idea of I mean come on a a human being a normal human being being able to memorize and and mimic all the like let's see if I recall correctly I've I've heard on YouTube like originally he learns martial arts by watching martial arts movies maybe that was maybe the character was created back when people still thought that was a thing today we know that can't you you need training you know that's i'm not saying that the amazing spider-man one is superior in every way to for example Raimi's spider-man 2 but the idea that you know in in Raimi's spider-man because it's the way in the comics Peter just has the power, you know, he just, he's just strong and fast. As, you know, right after, like, he, he gets bitten and he, he passes out, he wakes up, he's strong and fast. That's just not how it works in real life. You know, I mean, yeah. in real life, if you get bitten by a radioactive spider, no, in real life, you can't just suddenly be much stronger or faster than usual. And in The Amazing Spider-Man 1, they make... You know, they visually convey that Peter Parker is into skateboarding, so he already has, I guess, okay, so it's not strength, but agility, you know, dexterity, maybe, you know, stuff like that. He already had that from skateboarding, and now he has it in, you know, he can use it in a different way because of the spider powers. So I thought it made perfect sense. But I've heard some people say that, you know, this is basically like Baraka Pool. And, I mean, yeah, I, I wish I could argue with that, but it's, it, it's Baraka Pool. This is, this is Baraka Pool Taskmaster, and that just shouldn't be the case. It, it, it just, they should have come up with a new, just, all you have to do is come up with a different name and look, and that's it. Call the character anything else give them a, a different look don't invoke the look of the and and name of the of the comic book character and you can still give them that same like in the comics the the you know in in for Ragnarok we see Hela using what in the comics is called the necro sword which if i recall in the comics it belongs to gore the god butcher not Hela so it's fine to take elements from other characters but it's not like the, yeah, like, let's say that Hella was running around and doing God butchering. Then it'd be like, well, let's, why didn't you just use the other character that actually does that, you know? Either come up with a, a different, come, come up with something completely new, or, you know, I saw some people say it's, it's like with, with Iron Man 3, with the Mandarin. Yeah, kind of, kind of. In, in both cases, it didn't bother me much, because I don't think it's... I'm glad we're getting the proper Mandarin because I clearly he has a lot of fans and they are going to do it without being extremely racist so that's great but when I heard that the character was extremely racist and he was going to be in an MCU movie or you know, in in a movie he was going to be in a movie today I was like oh, I I really hope they don't and and then they cast um yeah you know cuz cuz he played Gandhi and that's also you know, he's he's played non-white. He's he, he's played POC before. I'm I'm glad that, you know, I'm glad we're getting him, but I, properly. But I'm I was relieved to find that it wasn't this crazy racist stereotype, you know. But for sure, with and and Taskmaster, I I don't have any personal connection to him. But I do understand people being frustrated, and they, they didn't have to make it Taskmaster. Like, in the comics, Taskmaster doesn't have anything to do with the Red Room, as far as I recall, so they already were, like, changing... You know, that change by itself wouldn't be a huge problem, but... The, yeah. Let's see... Right, and I noted, does this movie break with the following tradition? Outside of Iron Man 2, where she, among other things, has a wire for strangulating, pretty much the only equipment and weapons we see her use is stuff that carries an electric electrical charge 
Sometimes it's like a hidden blade in her wrist. Sometimes she fires little things that carry electrical charge. Sometimes these are in her wrist. Sometimes she'll throw small discs that carry an electrical charge. Sometimes she'll use one or more staffs and yeah, and her two block pistols, which spurred Rift Tracks to go, this is a job for tiny guns when she wielded them against aliens in Avengers 1. And yeah, it's still like she's she uses the she uses pistols and she uses the, the widow's bite, I think they call it, the electrical charge. But they still don't give her anything. I, I also saw some people criticize that in this movie she doesn't use her master spy you know abilities very much. It's mostly just she does big action scenes. And I I do think it's it's too bad, but I, I I'm not sure within the MCU formula we're gonna get a movie that's going to let her be a, a proper spy as a yeah. I wish. I hope that maybe someday, but now let's see. Right, so recent comic book movies since after Trump was elected criticize aspects of him through the villains and or framework issues. Now and and yeah, I was wondering if this was going to too. And Movie Bob said that the you know the bad guy in this movie represents violence against women. You know that basically. I'm not saying that Movie Bob is saying the following. I'm saying that's what this movie does to criticize Trump. And I'm going to briefly go over how the MCU movies criticize Trump. So starting in the year 2017, when Trump in her office, Guardians of the Galaxy One and Two is about how abuse can lead to trauma lasting for decades. Trump certainly causes a lot of trauma. It's also about that if your father or father figure abuses you, you might turn out to be terrible, which can be applied to a lot of the Trumps. Spider-Man Homecoming, the villain uses the fact that he's having trouble earning money in a legal way as an excuse to not only earn money in, other, in very shady ways, but also rationalizing threatening harm or even do harm to some of his enemies. Thor Ragnarok has empathy for refugees. The villain technically has a right to rule the country that they mean to rule, but they're a terrible leader and the country is destroyed as a direct result. That goes for both Loki and Hela. And Black Panther, T'Challa wants for his country to keep its riches to themselves, and the villain is specifically motivated by violence against innocent black people, including in America, so could, among other things, be inspired by Trump wanting the Central Park Five dead ex executed even after it was proven that they didn't do it. That brings us to Infinity War, where the villain thinks he knows what's best for everyone, and the only way to stop him is for everyone to band together, even the ones that you have major ideological problems with. In Ant-Man and the Wasp, one of the villains, played by Walton Goggins, Sonny Birch, makes money in illegal ways, even if it means that people suffer. An argument could be made that you can see some of Trump and Goliath, who brags about his size, maybe even in Ava Starr, whose disability prevents her from living a normal life with other people. In Trump's case, that would be narcissism and sociopathy, which has turned her bitter, and she lashes out at people who didn't cause it, but are just related, hope and dying. For Trump, basically anyone who doesn't give him exactly what he wants. And it's very easy to see Trump in the solo movie for Captain Marvel. The villains are basically fascists, brutalizing refugees and demonizing them. Jan Rog is a man who thinks that the only way for a woman to be strong is for a man to make her strong. He lies and manipulates a woman that wants to do yeah, that wants to do better, so you can see an allusion to the apprentice there. In the movie, Jan Rog is constantly telling Carol she needs to be less emotional, and sometimes himself emotional, similar to how Trump will criticize women for things he does himself. In Avengers Endgame, the villain wants the world to worship him, no matter how much death and destruction he would have to cause for that to happen. And Spider-Man Far From Home, the villain is a con artist who wants people to trust him so he can take advantage of them. And let's see. Right, so yeah, in, in one of the trailers, you know, Natasha asks how many others are there. I think it's Jillian who answers enough. And that made me note, so I guess now we're going to get the multiple super soldiers fight that we were promised in Civil War. And no, I mean, it's, they're, they're, they're not super soldiers, so it doesn't really count. And yeah, the Natasha says we have to go back to where it all started. So they never do that to anyone again. Excellent hope for this movie. Natasha has felt a lot of pain from her past as an assassin throughout her MCU appearances. It makes a lot of sense that she would take great risks to make sure it doesn't happen to anyone else. And, you know, I already mentioned that the movie explains it, but I want to specifically call out, I, I think it made a lot of sense to, you know, to explain that before the events of this movie, Natasha was an Avenger 
for most of the time that, like, yeah, you know, for a while she worked for Drakov, then she defected and became an Avenger, or uh, started working for S.H.I.E.L.D., and, and yeah, after that, the, once the Avengers were a thing, because the, technically the Avengers didn't exist before the events of the first movie, so, but, but yeah, anyway, whether she's working for S.H.I.E.L.D. or is an actual Avenger, Drakov didn't want that kind of heat, so he left her alone, even though he wished that he could kill her. And then in this movie, it's like, she's no longer an Avenger, technically, so that was a, a clever way to get around that. And, you know, she thought he was dead. She thought the Red Room had been destroyed. And because of that, no, no one else was a Black Widow, but now she finds out they are still around, and she finds that out by a former, you know, by someone who was very recently a Black Widow, so that's a that's a clever way of doing that, and she trusts Yelena, since, yeah. And, let's see. I think the trailers do a good job of showing Yelena being sarcastic. I didn't expect as much sarcasm as we did get in the movie, and yeah, I'm, I'm a fan. We all have to choose, at some point, we all have to choose between being what the world wants you to be and who you are. Good line. It seems like there are multiple ways to interpret it. I like that. And let's see. Yeah, I, I really like the, the trailers, and I wrote, I am really hyped for this. The car chase through city streets looks like Die Hard the Die Hard 5 one, if it were good. And it it was now, so, yeah, Sim similar to how, you know, when I watched the, the trailers for um, Infinity War, and you see the, the energy shield, that reminded me of the energy shields from the, I suppose, yeah, I'll just mention, you know, the, yeah, Star Wars Episode One: The Phantom Menace, where, you know, ultimately that isn't, that it's, it's a, it's a decent enough action scene, but the overall movie isn't good, but Infinity War is an excellent movie, so, you know, every every so often they'll take something. Also, how they, they've taken some inspiration from the, uh, the Matrix Reloaded, which also is nowhere near as good a movie as the first one. You know, they, they've taken from that for, for several of them. You know, let's see. We have Age of Ultron fighting on top of moving trucks a moving truck and that they also did that in Captain America and the Winter Soldier and in Captain America the Winter Soldier you have you know the Winter Soldier jumping onto the car and ripping off the roof now let's see the um, It's, it's, you know, so, so uh, I and others theorized that, you know, the reason that Natasha looked scared of Taskmaster in the trailers, when they, when they both do the, the jump to get back up to their feet, she looks scared, and several people, you know, yeah, I and others, I'm, I'm not saying only other people did, I'm including myself here, we thought that meant that she was like, ah, oh, it must be like Hawkeye or something, but no, it's, you know, she's like, how can she she's like it's it's basically like you know with she can't how how can she defeat someone who can use her own moves against her you know her strength lies in that she has moves that are difficult to that you know if you don't know the moves you can't counter it but she tries you know she she wraps yeah does i, I think she she wraps her thighs around him and tries to use that as a move, which, I mean, has that ever not worked? I, th I think in all the other movies it works, even when she does it to, like, robots and aliens, you know. But here, you know, he he counters it and does it to her. So, that you know, that's why she's, like, scared of him. She, she's impressed by, yeah, her, his abilities. It, it, yeah. Anton, Antonia's abilities scare her, and it's also this, like... You know, she's like, how how can I defeat someone who 
can do everything that I can do. So, yeah, you know, but, yeah, we all thought, you know, and, like, the, the true identity was a twist, but it just wasn't what we had guessed. And, yeah, so, I'm, yeah, I wouldn't be disappointed if it didn't, but I wonder if this movie will do more interesting things with Natasha than Civil War, which I would say is when she's the most complex, the least predictable. In some of the others, she's not quite as interesting. In order of the most interesting to least interesting, Civil War, Age of Ultron, Endgame, Avengers 1, Infinity War, and Iron Man 2. I would say this is up there with Civil War, yes. I, I don't know if it quite tops Civil War, but it's up there with it. So that's really good. Since we already know that the characters in this movie are not in Infinity War or Endgame, they will not interact with Natasha again as long as she's alive. As, as far as we've seen, technically it's possible. Yeah. Does this movie do a good job of resolving the relationships or is it very frustrating that we will not see Natasha with these people ever again? And yeah, I I mean, there at the end, she's basically, she's she forgives them for the wrong that they've done. And that leads her to try to for to make the thing with the the other Avengers work again. I I do I I mean we're gonna see Yelena again, we know that already in the Hawkeye miniseries, but the let's see where she's been confirmed as cast. We don't I, I'm not sure we know for sure if, if we're gonna see Alexei or Yel uh, Melina. There we go. Again, I guess if we don't, it's it's a f decent way to end things. But yeah, the movie does not bring Natasha back or hint at bringing her back. The the you know the theory that she's alive on but stranded on Warmir, which I think maybe it was written in Endgame like that, so that hypothetically, if Scarlett Johansson says she wants to do more movies, and, and they, you know, and they want to set those after Endgame, they can bring her back. But, the, yeah, so, so, let's see. Um, that was, that was a thing. And, the, you know, because, yeah, technically we don't know what happens you know, if if you if you give back the soul stone in at Vormir, does that bring the person who was who sac yeah who was sacrificed or sacrificed themselves? Does that bring them back to life? We don't know, but it's it's hypothetically possible. And if we never do see her again, if they don't bring up that element, then I guess not. I guess dead is dead. And yeah, this movie does not explain why they didn't help during Infinity War and Endgame. I can understand if they simply didn't get there in time for Infinity War and then were dusted. I guess that's what we're just supposed to think. Now let's see, Yelena was the same age at the end, which we know takes place after Endgame, that she was in the rest in in you know in the 2016 scenes. So I guess it's possible she was dust. Oh, actually, yeah. Even dusting doesn't quite explain it, because the the let's see, 2016 was it was it like five years that are between, or was it three, two, two or three years? I, I'm not 100% sure, but technically she should look at least a little bit older there at the end, even if she was dusted. But yeah. Now, let's see. Yeah, so, spoiling the born supremacy. To, to Bucky Civil War, the movie is basically the born supremacy. Is this a lot like one of the born movies to any character in this? And not really, no. Hmm. I suppose... Okay, actually, yeah, so, spoiling the Bourne Ultimatum, there's definitely some Bourne Ultimatum going on here, because they're going back to where it all started, the room where it all started, where they were 
trained and and the whole thing and they're making sure that it can't be they can't keep doing it by by you know bringing it down and in born ultimatum it's by spreading the information and and making there be these you know trials and such where in this movie it's you know because it's a more like crowd pleaser blockbuster it's just by blowing it up and and yeah anyway no more spoilers for the born movies does this actually have several black widows from the red room and able to take out natasha in at least one scene i get the appeal of having multiple black widows involved in an action scene but it kind of undermines how threatening they are if they can't take out a single target with their forces combined Ultimately, I thought they did a decent enough job of explaining, but yeah, it is basically just Natasha taking out several with the with the wrist zappers, but the others do have those two, and they don't manage, to, or at least they don't stop the right away. I, yeah, that's when Yelena gasses them to, to bring them out of, yeah. Are there too many factions in this movie? As far as I understand, Ross will be hunting Natasha, but we also have groups of Black Widows. So does that get to be too much? And and no, I I think you know because Ross isn't that much of a presence. Now let's see. I guess I think that might be all of the notes that I have. I'm just gonna skim to see if I have anything else. That was all of it. So, yeah, back to, this is the longest video I've made in a while. Anyway, if you like this video, please comment, thumbs up, and subscribe. There should be a link to my main channel page and one, two, or more links to relevant playlists on the screen right about now. I put out one vlog per week, and currently they tend to come out very similar to this one. So if you want more like this, you're in luck. I hope you enjoyed watching, as I enjoyed watching and recording, and I'll catch you next time.